People in the room could just take a seat so we're not in the way of the camera. People in the middle of the room in a red shirt and a white top talking could just take a seat. People in the middle of the room in a red shirt completely ignoring me. Can you just sit down, please? Because the camera is behind you. Thank you. They're going to talk after. Don't worry. So welcome, everybody. Um, before we begin this plenary session, just a reminder, we're joined by our online audience today. So thank them for being with us. So hello, online audience. And as ever, we have interpretation in the room. So our interpreters are working very hard over there. So if you'd like a different language, you know how to get it on the headphones. We also have a live screen up here, which both you in the room and you online can add questions to. So people in the room, there is a QR code on the screen. If you want to zap that, that will be your opportunity to send in comments and questions to our esteemed panel. And if you're online, we'll be dropping a link to that same site into the chat online any moment now. Okay, then without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dare, who is our moderator for this panel, to, to take you forward to talk about durable solutions. So thanks very much, Dare. Thank you, Charlie. Um, do you hear me? Good. I don't know how does that work, but that's good. Um, it is a pleasure for me, first of all, to, uh, to moderate this very important session. Durable Solutions and the CCCM. I will probably allow myself to start with a couple of very short stories of what I have experienced in my short lifespan in CCCM. And then I will introduce our um, panelists who are or claim to be experts in solutions. <laughs> But then we will give them the chance to show us to which extent they can solve the problem for us. But it is most important to see from the experiences they have been through, but also to know what exactly is happening at the different arenas. We are all sometimes, for good reasons, very busy to look to other places. So I think that's why we will learn a lot from, from the colleagues. Almost. 15 years ago, I was walking around in one of the biggest refugee camps. Now we said that this is a cluster, but of course the examples come from different contexts. I was in the dark walking around and I saw people building a school. By that time I spent some years in, in the area so I could figure out when they were speaking they were not speaking Somali. They were speaking Kiswahili when they were building the school, where we had half a million people as refugees in one or the largest camp that exists. Then I said, I was working with the police. I said, but uh, so those are, those are not from, from the people here, not from the population. Half a million people, don't we have anyone who is able have the skills ready to build the schools for themselves. Now, I don't know whether the answer was accurate or not, so I don't want to claim, but my colleagues told me, you know, it was very difficult to find people ready to work from the camp because they have been here for a long time. They have been receiving the aid, they have been receiving the support, so they don't work. We have to bring workers from the other nearby villages. Normally also the camps, Always in our imagination, if you tell people to draw a camp, we normally draw a big map, we put a camp somewhere. But if you look at the other camps now in the world, if you look at Atma, if you look, look at, uh, 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 again, all, all the camps without mentioning the names, in many cases, the camps have become much bigger even than the neighboring cities. To which extent we are speaking about temporary solutions here? We have to speak about longer term durable solutions. Now, my last thing on that is we as a humanitarian community have been using lots of board jargons. You know, we move from one word to another. If you go to our dictionary, we get always confused. But what the problem is indeed in many, many cases and in many aspects, and this is really something I think, and I really hope 
that we will be able to clarify is what these words mean for us. All of us, one understanding, one definition, what do these words mean? Solution. I was in Ukraine. I was discussing solution with the colleagues. One of them stood up. He said, look there, I don't know why exactly you are talking. We have been doing solutions. We are solving a problem. I have been solving problems for the past 30 years. So why are you coming to tell me now we have to be solution oriented? I have been doing that. And I said, oh my God, he is right, actually. We have been solving a problem in one way or another, but what does it mean? It's more durable, it's in a different way of thinking. So it will be really good for us to, um, to find a common um, understanding to this one. So with that, I would love to introduce this good selection of experts that could tell us how does durable solution link to CCCM? What have we been doing? And what can we do more? This will be the way that we moderate. People will introduce themselves. I have some pre-selected questions. So as you know, it's not like a movie, but you know, it's not a surprise for them. So we don't want to stress them out. So then they will moderate by asking you questions or you asking them questions. So first of all, I would like to start with you. Please introduce yourself to the uh, group here. Hi, all. Uh, you hear me? Uh, cool. I'm Reem. Uh, from uh, working for uh, REACH Regional MENA, supporting uh, different missions, uh, Syria, Yemen, and different missions, uh, based in Amman, uh, and I'm um, working on the plot project mainly for two years now. Thank you, Reem. James. Right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is James Mashari. I am the CCM Cluster Co-Coordinator from Somalia. For those who attended the localization uh, process, you're aware we uh, call it with uh, Ben Connor. He's not here now, but yeah, we call it with him. Um, and uh, we are from CCM Cluster. Yes, and just before you start, as we agree that we also, as, as James mentioned, that we were very much looking forward to having the local authorities from Somalia and the colleague also coming here, but unfortunately they could not come due to, I think, visa related issues so this is an, an unfortunate situation for us but we just agree that at least we will acknowledge that then the other james yes, yes. speak just here hello oh there it's working now darren <laughs> i like it uh, James MacArthur, uh, Senior Assessment Specialist with REACH um, at our uh, HQ in, in Switzerland and supporting uh, the CCM cluster uh, globally. Thank you. Thank you, Nick Cart, uh, UNHCR Senior Policy Officer, former Protection Cluster Coordinator and other roles in Yemen, Syria, South Sudan, uh, including uh, advisory groups on solutions. However, I don't claim to be an expert on solutions. Um, but I think everyone here, more than anyone else in this room, because I think hopefully you'll see throughout our session that uh, actually everyone is an expert on solution and solutions and already um, playing an active role. I know, I don't need that, Mike. Thanks. And I think it's, it's uh, I was just trying to make a joke. No, I don't, I don't think that none of us should uh, claim that we are experts. Uh, probably except why one and I, but uh, that's that's fine. Um, now, Nick. So let's let's start. So colleagues will have some presentations. Nick, yesterday somebody from New York, Ocha, joined us. A colleague Sebastian, who discussed some important stuff happening at the Secretary General's level. People sitting in New York and other places, IDP action agenda, and also they discussed. Uh, the independent external review of the system. So I think in all these things, if we go through the document, they are mentioning solutions every other line. So Nick, over to you to explain how we can link this together with what we do as CCCM. Because, you know, colleagues, I am a little bit worried that if we really don't have a very clear and a strong answer, our future is at risk as CCCM. Over to you, Nick. Louder. 
Okay. Okay, is, is that better? Yes, go. Speak now. All right, so yesterday uh, we heard from Sebastian, who introduced the uh, Secretary General's Action Agenda on Internal Displacement. Um, and it's going to be launched on Friday, um, from what he said yesterday. So it's a timely uh, time to, to discuss the Action Agenda and how it applies to um, CCM cluster and CCCM partners. Um, it already might sound like this is going to be a dry um, <laughs> presentation, but it, after it's launched, you're going to see it's, um, there's going to be a lot happening in all the operations and it's going to become the centerpiece. But I want to focus on some of the practical ways um, in which CCCM contributes uh, to the action agenda, specifically the IASC framework on durable solutions, which the uh, action agenda is going to reaffirm, um, which has been, the, the draft has been circulated for external review and Sebastian confirmed yesterday um, that this will be the case. So the action agenda, which we launched on Friday, states that we must work towards prevention, response, and sol solutions simultaneously as part of a comprehensive approach. Action to address internal displacement must start with recognizing the rights and agency of IDPs and host communities and ensure their in active and informed participation in decision-making, including respecting their right to choose their own, uh, the solution that's best for them. Approaches should be guided by the knowledge of local communities and address the specific needs of people of different ages, gender, abilities, and diversity, including by promoting gender equality and the best interests of the child. The action agenda emphasizes a whole of society approach, including strong involvement of civil society, national human rights institutions, and the private sector to ensure that action is locally owned and informed and that it draws on the full spe spectrum of available capabilities, um, also taking into account urban ecosystems. Action should be based on high quality and trusted data and analysis, which James will be talking more about later uh, in his session. So when does action by the CCM cluster and partners to achieve durable solutions commence. From the moment of displacement is, is, is the answer. Collectively with IDPs and all the stakeholders I just mentioned. The end goal is return local integration or settlement elsewhere. The top three here, which you're all very familiar with. Um, however, to achieve one of these solutions, there are many small solutions that need to be achieved along the way. And the, CC and the CCM cluster and partners have an important role to play in this. IDPs in sites are often the most vulnerable or marginalized people during displacement. That is often why they are in sites and not integrated temporarily within the host community itself either because they don't have family or friends in the area, the community doesn't have the capacity to absorb and support them, or because they are, they've been marginalized. So overcoming obstacles and achieving small solutions on the road to achieving durable solutions um, is a priority in IDP sites. These small solutions are related to the eight criteria which are listed here, which have been reaffirmed um, by the Secretary General's action agenda. These can be used to determine to what extent a durable solution has been achieved. Um, and they, these, these are from the IASC framework uh, on durable solutions. Achieving these, I'm calling them small solutions, uh, center around engagement with IDPs in the sites, starting with identifying the threats and obstacles that an individual needs to overcome. 
CCM partners are in a unique position to engage because the IDPs are already collected together and you can engage with them on a daily or regular basis. And there are different ways of engagement, such as meetings with camp management committees, um, ensuring equal representative representation um, of age, gender, disability, diversity, et cetera. Day-to-day -day engagement with individuals, referrals, um, various assessments, et cetera. I just wanna briefly touch on us. yes. Thank you. Um, touch on assessments. We have to be careful uh, with assessments. We as humanitarians tend to overassess uh, IDPs. And as site managers, it's important to ensure that assessment is coordinated through the subnational ICWGs, uh, intercluster working groups, uh, et cetera. And as humanitarians, we love intention surveys related to solutions um, and, the, the and the data that comes from them. But intention surveys can be stressful for IDPs. For example, they can create anxiety that humanitarians or authorities want to move them or force return. Community leaders or others may also influence how people respond for political or other reasons. It's not to say that we shouldn't be doing intention surveys, but we just have to be careful and has to be proper um, analysis done before they're carried out. Um, a better approach may be through a community protection or information desk in a site where people can come voluntarily um, to discuss their intentions and various risk or obstacles they are, they are facing. With this in mind, let's quickly unpack these eight criteria and see what action can be taken by the cluster um, and partners to achieve small solutions on the, on the road to return local integration or settlement elsewhere. I'll briefly run through each one with a couple of possible examples and then we'll um, see if anyone, if you can give concrete uh, examples of activities from your current response. So the first one is long-term safety and security which is physical safety and security on the basis of effective protection by national and local authorities. This includes protection from those threats which cause the initial displacement and may cause renewed displacement. So first there's a need to understand the, from the IDPs what those threats are um, from people of all age, uh, gender, diversity, et cetera. Displacement and its social consequences also render women, boys and girls more vulnerable to exploitation, intrafamily violence or, or sexual violence, which must be addressed um, in the sites. And this is through referrals um, to the relevant partners, uh, the protection cluster, AORs, et cetera, advocacy, um, and so on. IDPs also need to be able to move freely within their areas where they are displaced and be able to return and come back uh, as they please. For example, travel restrictions that apply to IDPs in a site um, or a specific area that don't apply to the resident population generally pose a serious obstacle to IDPs eventually uh, achieving durable solutions. So IDPs need to be able to access national and local protection mechanisms including police, courts, national human rights institutions, um, and national disaster management services. To support this, the CCCM cluster, for example, could advocate to have free legal services in a site, including visits by a legal aid practitioner, um, especially if IDPs can't access these in the community um, or, and perhaps due to mobility issues, et cetera. The second one, enjoyment of an adequate standard of living without discrimination. This is at a minimum shelter, healthcare, food, water, sanitation, education, and other means of survival. Again, only the IDPs themselves can inform you of this. Um, and all of the above needs, uh, all of the action for all of the above is needed in all sites, uh, as we know. And, 
for example, beyond shelter, healthcare wash, there is education. So when a child eventually can return or integrate or resettle, um, they will continue their education. So it's important during displacement that education continues for a child. And that may be through advocating for IDPs to attend local schools, mobile classroom in the sites, et cetera, coordinated through the education cluster. Access to livelihoods and employment is the third one. Um, it's important to ensure that IDPs in these sites are included in livelihood opportunities, skills and education and other areas, for example, that they have identification documents for to gain uh, gainful employment. Again, this is through referrals, advocacies, adv advocacy, et cetera. Then effective and accessible mechanisms to restoring housing, land and property. So the, pro the process of restitution and compensation is complex and very time consuming. And it's not necessary for this process to be fully concluded before IDPs can be said to have found a durable solution. The determining factor is that they have access to effective and accessible mechanisms for property restitution and compensation, which includes legal advice. Um, so again, action needs to start in the sites from the moment uh, of displacement. So this can be referrals to legal services, referrals to the housing, land and property AOR, if it exists in country, uh, et cetera. Then access to personal and other documentation without discrimination, which is the fifth criteria. During the course of displacement, as we know, people often lose documents necessary for the enjoyment and exercise of their legal rights, such as passports, personal ID, birth certificates, marriage certificates, voter uh, identity cards, etc. Or they may not have had these in the first place. So here, CCM cluster, in coordination with others can refer um, people to civil registration centers or legal services if necessary, or protection partners, for example. Family reunification. As we know, many families become separated and should be reunited as quickly as possible, particularly when children, older persons or other vulnerable people are involved. Appropriate tracing needs to be taken at the earliest possible time. So again, this is um, advocating with specialized agencies to prioritize IDP sites um, when it comes to family tracing, for example. Uh, also for site planning, to ensure uh, proper site planning for the full family unit and potential for expansion of a plot if they're expecting other family members to come and join. The seventh one, participation in public affairs without discrimination. Um, IDPs need to be able to exercise their right to participate in public affairs, elections, uh, and so on. This often requires special measures to be implemented before any chance of return local integration or settlement in, in another part of the country. Where large numbers of IDPs have not returned, it may be necessary to carry out registration or education programs uh, in the sites themselves and establish uh, polling, polling stations in a site, depending on the context. For example, South Sudan, there's an election coming up uh, early next year. And the final one, access to effective remedies and justice. Um, and this involves engagement with peace actors, uh, advocacy um, and other stakeholders. So, and all of the, so that, that's the eight criteria, all of addressing all of which should be done collectively, uh, including with engagement of relevant clusters, actors, authorities, et cetera, and ultimately feed into area-based approaches around solutions or any national strategies. I'll stop there. Sorry if that was a little bit dry, but it's important to highlight this because these are the eight criteria. Now these criteria are not exclusive. For example, I understand that in Iraq, they've added a, a ninth one around psychosocial support. Um, and we'll hit soon hear a good example from Somalia, from James. So at this point, I'll open it up just to see if anyone can give us an example of a, 
CCCM activity related to any of these criteria um, that you're currently implementing or have implemented in the past. Not a strategy, because we'll come to that later, but a specific activity related to any of these, these criteria. Try to just give us in one sentence or in two sentences one example about what has been mentioned by Nick. Feel free to completely disagree with Nick also. Yes. Yeah, just, just try again. Thank you. Uh, I want to give an example in, uh, from Nigeria, and that's based on the durable solution, UNHCR and IOM. They are doing one durable solution in area called Yola, specifically for uh, UNHCR in Labondo, linked with uh, local integration. Those people stay for more than 10 years. And now to move forward from staying in the camps, we find uh, land, new land, allocated by the local authorities, and then to design a new settlement with a durable housing in terms of shelters, livelihood activities, and uh, local integration with a QIPS project for uh, people that living there in terms of uh, hospital, health center, school, and market, and uh, bring the partners that working for uh, for a CCCM to find those people that in need to be in that new area with the criteria that define. And then when the people arrive there, they will follow them as a new experience for a durable solution. And uh, now we are in the phase of the construction, but it's a new idea to integrate all these thematic in one uh, activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, and let's focus on a, a specific activity that you're doing in a site related to addressing one of these, um, achieving one of these small solutions related to this, these criteria. Uh, thank you, Nick, for an excellent presentation and for reminding us of these uh, criteria and the options within the framework of durable solutions. I'm not going to give you an activity uh, because what you presented is an ideal world uh, that remains on paper, but the reality on the ground is that uh, the process is more difficult than what we're seeing from the uh, IASC framework. For instance, the condition that forced people to flee to camps might have ceased to exist, but then other conditions keep coming in and you don't see an option of ending the camp life. And also fundings are going down. You cannot keep on doing the camp operation, not only for CCCM, but also for other sectors. So what solutions is the Inter agency standing committee thinking about? Exclusive of these eight criteria. Fantastic. I think, first of all, Thank you very much, Nick. Now we announce you as an expert one on solutions. So the first one has been identified. A good segue with the question that is coming from you to give the floor to Somalia to tell us how possible is that and how can we take only one segment without giving um, a wrong image? The closure is not the one and the only solution. It is just one of the solutions. So James, tell us about Somalia. Let's be, please, short. Let's give more space for discussions, OK? Over to you. Working? The mic is not working. Take the other one. Now it's working. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Dale. And um, I would just like to highlight uh, one thing, as uh, you already said, uh, this initiative in Somalia, we call it Side Definition Initiative, 
we conducted uh, bilaterally all together with the Ministry of Humanitarian and Disaster uh, Management uh, and CCCM. And unfortunately, uh, the counterpart who was supposed to come did not come. So I guess that the chair is symbolic. It was meant to be six people in the panel. So unfortunately, it could not come. So having said that, I'm going to give you just a, a slight uh, background and context and that will give us uh, an understanding on what we are doing. Uh, in terms of uh, numbers, Somalia has about 2 million, uh, 2.9 million of IDPs, uh, and majority of these are in are self-settled. We would actually say over 80 percent are self-settled in a plant site, and most of these places where they are self-settled is land that is on is on private land, is not on public land. Uh, CCM has access to about uh, uh, 30, 40 percent of that presence. This data is the official one uh, by the Somalia National Bureau of Statistics. Otherwise, uh, with CCM site verification and DSA uh, detailed site assessment, actually the numbers show that we have uh, more, more figures than this. So just pointing it out that in case you read other data that shows we have more than 3.3 million, that's based on uh, like the current DSA. Um, the other point, uh, just to point out on uh, displacement in Somalia is twofold. I know yesterday we talked about natural disasters. Actually, that is one of the main driver of displacement, drought, flooding, uh, as well as uh, desert locust, although this one is on a small scale, as well as uh, conflict. So we have disaster, disaster as one of the drivers, and then the other is, um, uh, is conflict. And uh, when you talk of conflict, as those of you who know a little bit about Somalia, uh, we've had, we had the fall of, uh, I mean, the conflict since the fall of the government in 1990, and, uh, and this has led to like some instability. Uh, and since then, there have been displacements, and some of these have been for 10, uh, 20 years, uh, as we normally uh, uh, see from the assessment that we do, uh, around uh, a third of the sites that we've talked about, they have actually existed for 10 or 20 years uh, plus. So these are like protracted cases. So when it's protraction, then we are asking if people have been in these sites for like 30 years, uh, do we still look at them as IDP sites or should we be talking of solution? Do we talk of more of integrating these people given that these people may not uh, go back? Again, just to remind you, this is not, the quest it's not just a question of CCM, it's the Ministry of uh, Humanitarian Affairs that we were working with and in engaging in that kind of discussion. So this is what led to uh, now going more into details on what we could do, for example, do we look at those sites which have been uh, existing for so long uh, and which have actually uh, have access to some services, uh, look at them as more for integration rather than looking at them as IDP sites. Um, moving ahead, one of the goals, our main goal actually is now to have a harmonized understanding of IDP sites in Somalia, uh, have a common standards of what we mean when we talk of IDP sites, uh, and with the name of mapping out those sites that have uh, a viability of being considered as durable solution sites, uh, or even uh, find a way of facing out uh, those sites, or come up with a mechanism of uh, facing out those sites. Uh, and the main uh, objective of this initiative is um, uh, one, to have uh, a clear understanding, for example, of who is, who is not an IDP. In fact, uh, using the government policy document, one of the uh, definitions we derive it from the national, um, uh, national uh, strategy for durable solution, which normally actually encompasses quite wide, it encompasses IDPs as uh, those who've been displaced by conflict and conflict is quite wide, those who've been displaced because of being evicted from land and they don't have sufficient housing uh, and so on, and those who have not, um, who have actually uh, been displaced from their area of pastoral, uh, nomadic pastoral life. So it encompasses comp actually three points, uh, conflict, uh, land evictions, as well as pastoral life um, and who have experienced like loss of livelihood and so on and so forth. So we try to have that understanding uh, across board of who an IDP is. Um, secondly, is to uh, ensure that we, um, <laughs> we have, uh, we have um, a clear understanding of, um, uh, of the, to, to, to make awareness on the fact that we don't want to uh, have a uh, limitation of assistance that these sites uh, don't have, uh, we have achieved durable solution, so this one, they don't need any assistance, no. But actually is to have a focus on, for example, uh, 
cluster way of looking at those sites since there are so many and having more focused approach. Uh, then we all look, we're also looking at uh, the development and humanitarian uh, relationship. Um, how, how do we, what, at what point do we say this is humanitarian and at what, what point do we start discussing like uh, durable solutions? And then uh, finally to create, uh, as I mentioned, some mechanism of discussing on, uh, on closure of some sites. Um, we have revisited this for reasons that, um, for some reasons, uh, to revisit the site definition, given that the current definition actually normally encompasses like 15 households. And now we have, uh, we have sites that actually have, from DSA, you have like uh, over 263 sites that would have less than 50 households, for example, or 300 individuals, uh, around 500, over 500 sites. So when you look at just that sheer magnitude, for example, when you look at this uh, hall, this would be enough to call it an IBP site that requires all those services. So should we not be talking more about consolidation, for example, uh, of, of some sites, uh, which are very small, which of end relocation, and so on, uh, and so forth. Um, I will move a little bit quickly because of time. Uh, the next point we wanted to just highlight some of the milestones, how we come up with this is uh, number one, we had at least a look at what has been done before for people to understand what are sites, what are not IDP sites and what are not IDP sites. We actually learned that uh, from that, 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 like let's say desktop review, if you like, uh, people like Dell try to work on this more than 10 years ago in Somalia. Uh, we are still there trying to find a common understanding of this definition and trying to find uh, solutions. Uh, we also, um, we also, um, we also like um, uh, uh, want to do this. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my <laughs> track of that. Um, on 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 the next milestone is actually the the uh, the. Uh, the, the forum that we had with interagencies as well as uh, with IDP working group so that we can have a, we can have a common understanding on criteria on uh, what we mean for with IDP sites and what are IDP sites and what are not IDP sites. Uh, and what to, that led us to have like a federal workshop where we had an interministerial discussion with uh, a department from, for example, Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs Disasters, a key ministry like Ministry of Planning, uh, Ministry of Interior, and so on and so forth. And we are actually more than 10 uh, ministries. And then that gave us a, a, a launching pad where we are able to go to different locations and try to contextualize uh, different states and how they view IDP sites. Um, and IDP, uh, IDPs themselves, and when can we talk of uh, sites being closed, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we actually came up with, uh, moving ahead uh, on the on the, on uh, some of the outcomes and the next steps that we have achieved so far, is that when you move across the country, talk to different authorities, they actually agree with you. Yes, some sites have existed for so long and we need to be talking of how we would close them uh, once especially once we do like clarity and assessment of some of the gaps and needs and making sure that we know this is what this is the far that the humanitarians can do and this is again uh, what uh, development partners should be doing uh, and one of the common messages as we talked about uh, as we mentioned land is one of the key factors and there's been that willingness from the government across states to say we actually are willing to give to provide land uh, the question is, are development partners and others able to uh, pro provide the, the other prerequisite requirement, like uh, services like, uh, like housing, as uh, one of the colleagues how to, uh, highlighted health uh, and education and, and livelihoods and so on. Um, and then uh, we also, in terms of the next steps for what we are preparing with the uh, government is now to bring, to have like a launch with all those stakeholders that have been involved at the state level, uh, to come together and have these guidelines put into a policy document that can be integrated to government policy document uh, on uh, questions of uh, like sites that have permanent land. Do we still consider them as IDP sites or should we now put them at a different category where now we are looking at the, durable, the necessary durable solutions that needs to be met and then these, those sites can be phased out. Then the CCM cluster would also be mapping out as uh, the, the ones that have uh, already been considered as viable for durable solutions, what are the gaps uh, that needs to be met? Uh, if it's water, let's say this site has 80% has water based on the data that we have. 
uh, because we normally do site service monitoring, for example, uh, is if it's held, we have like 80% access. So we are talking of giving clear data that shows if we do, we fulfill the 20% that is left, then this site should be uh, no longer verified as IDP sites, uh, they should be closed. Uh, and then finally, we are also hoping to have like that sort of action oriented data. We're able to map out sites which have had land titles, for example, uh, or those who have, which have long term land tenures, uh, which is one of the key requirements of durable solution. Um, I leave it there, uh, maybe with this beautiful picture of one of those sites that we've been able to collaborate uh, with government. Uh, it's more or less like the similar example given from Nigeria, where uh, partners have come together and they're able to relocate um, uh, IDPs to a proper site uh, which is planned and uh, services provided. And now the initiative is that such sites should not be referred to as uh, IDP sites. And that's the example of some of the initiative that we are doing from Somalia from our end. Thank you very much. Expert number two, thank you. So, um, now, I think we have questions that are coming from the online participants. And we have the tables open for questions or ideas or disagreements. I, I can only say that it's not an easy subject. I was in Somalia 10 years ago. We had this big countrywide workshop with the title on when displacement ends 10 years ago we had a big fight everyone fought, had a fight with everyone by that time uh, because we made a wrong question on who is an idp and everyone ended becoming an idp you know i think we are all idps at a certain stage of our life so uh, it's a bit difficult topic to address in general um i don't see hands up from here um here we have one colleague from this side, you, you wanted to say something, right? Please take the, take the mic. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Mr. Said Al-Khali from Nigeria. Uh, mine is not a question. I can thank you very much for your presentation. And I think this is, uh, you have taught a lot on what, what is, now, uh, what is worrying uh, the government a lot in the Northeast Nigeria? I think the government of Nigeria, Borno State, has uh, already planned for the return of IDPs. And some has uh, camp closure, in particular, let me say camp closure, of which subsequently return and then is dealing also with the durable solution. So my own is just an idea or whatever I would like to share with all. We are doing the return, closing camps, returning IDPs, relocating resettlement. We have a strategic plan in place, but uh, to be sincere, unfortunately, we are not going by the strategy. The government at the higher level are looking at why the IDPs should live for a very long time in the camps. So it's better they should start moving them close to their areas of uh, future residence, but not really return. Very few among the IDPs are uh, returned, but mostly relocation, meaning most of them are going back on secondary displacement because they are going back to stay in the camp or camp like setting on the host community in these areas of return by the government as defined by the government. Mm -hmm. So I would like the CCCM uh, cluster to look into this issue of durable solution and camp closure very critical because uh, most of times I can, from my own experience, durable solution just started just uh, like uh, uh, just one day, government decided to work with the partners that we want to return IDPs. But I think it shouldn't be like that. Maybe at, at any time, whenever comes, uh, uh, what is it, 
uh, a, a, a camp is, uh, is cited, durable solution should be start. What is it? We should start working on durable solution on the first day of the camp management. I think it will give more insight to the government to know exactly what to do. Because at all the time, the government, yes, is trying to say we push because it's to them, to the to government, to us, it's an achievement to say we have returned. And but we need more of your uh, support in, in, the, in putting the rural solution in places before you close the camp. We shouldn't allow, uh -huh. uh, because you are there for technical advice, for technical capacity, and also support in putting things and making us understand better. So we need more support in that area because this is now area of concern. We definitely have to work on more support. Yes, sorry. Um, which question? There are many questions that are online. We also want to give the chance for the colleagues there. Ruxandra, maybe if you want to read a comment or and a question from, from, the, uh, from the other side. Thank you there. Uh, appreciated uh, that we have quite a few questions from colleagues online and from here in the room, so we understand that they, uh, some of you may have already posed them here, so we'll give a chance to that. And hopefully we'll have a bit of a, of a debate and a discussion. Please feel free to interact uh, as much as possible. Um, we'll take one of the questions and please panelists, uh, whomever wants to respond first, please go ahead. How uh, to start implementing durable solutions and at which point as a technical advice? So from a technical perspective, what would you consider a good starting point for CCCM to start implementing uh, durable solution activities. Nick. Louder. Um, good question. I would say <clears throat> uh, action should start um, when the person, when the IDPs themselves request assistance to address an obstacle that they're facing to achieve durable solutions. Um, it's ultimately the decision of the IDP themselves. Um, I, I, sh I, I guess that question is related to the end goal here in terms of return, uh, uh, settlement in another part of the country or local integration. So that, I mean, all of these, these uh, small solutions need to be achieved before that, that can be achieved. So work should start straight away, um, starting with engaging with the IDPs themselves to identify what are the barriers, what are the threats, the risks, the obstacles, and to start working on them one by one to address them. Just very briefly, I think it depends from context to context. And as I give the example of uh, when you have like sites which have existed for more than 30 years and people have not returned, then I think the discussion is um, how do we integrate them? Whereas when it's just a short wave of displacement because of conflict and people need to go back, then maybe you may not, uh, you may be talking of return. Um, um, and so, and then if it's not that, then depending on how you're working with the government, because this is really a question that is central and primary to governments, is to help them in case the people may not return and may, people may not uh, be integrated if there is a possibility of relocating them, like uh, the, the picture here, these people have been mainly relocated to a place uh, uh, other than where they were staying. And of course, as Nick said, with their participation and based on, let's say, intention uh, surveys, whether they will to, to be relocated to a different place. So thank you. Thank you, um, James. So I think now, um, Charlie, do you want to, to, to say something? You have a question? Yeah, OK, that's, that's, that's true. I got a mic. I forgot. Um, so. What we can do is let's see how the time will go and um, the, the questions are online by the way they are also not only for this specific event these questions will be taken forward uh, discussed among ourselves and they also even probably brought higher to the agenda discussions and to the review discussions. so please keep typing writing your comments and your your, your questions as well um, now if i am allowed 
I would like to move to the other James from REACH to tell us about data. Tell us how information management analysis is important in the context of bringing solution angle pillar to the CCCM work. Thank you, Dare. Um, I think it's a, a very important question. And I think whether what we're talking about in terms of the uh, mentioned by, by Nick and James, uh, the eight criteria of durable solutions, um, we need, uh, we need uh, evidence, we need data and analysis to inform uh, CCM cluster, to inform camp managers, to inform all the multiple stakeholders um, on how to act uh, on uh, such solutions or durable solutions, whether that is return, integration, or settlement elsewhere. And I'm speaking today on this, on this panel, not as uh, a camp manager or uh, an operational NGO, but coming as a, uh, an assessment specialist um, who uh, uh, wants to better understand how we can provide, uh, how can we provide you with the right data and the right type of analysis at the right time um, in terms of the, the phase of the CCM response, in terms of the phase of, 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 uh, of the emergency response to the humanitarian development nexus. So I think that uh, when we talk about, oh, sorry, I need to move my slide over. When we talk about um, uh, CCCM, of course, in the very first phase of an emergency, we're going to need data and analysis at the site level. We need to know where sites are. We need to know how many sites are there are. We need to know how many people are in those sites. We need to know site definitions and site typologies, as James mentioned. These are all very important questions that we need to understand in that first phase of an emergency response uh, as CCM cluster. Uh, but we also need to transition eventually um, from the site level to data and analysis and evidence at perhaps an area-based level, as we saw yesterday in, in, in the workout breakout groups, uh, conducting assessments and providing data analysis at an area-based level uh, can be extremely useful, not only for informing area-based coordination, uh, but also uh, for informing potential durable solutions and making sure that there's data uh, and evidence there to inform that uh, decision making. And during this transition, uh, we're looking at uh, four key criteria. We're looking at defining that area. Um, we're looking at the uh, multi-sectoral approach of the actors and in the intervention in this area. We're looking at the entire population. We're looking at the resident community, the hosts, the internally displaced people themselves, uh, not just at the site level. Uh, so it's more inclusive in terms of the data and analysis that's available, uh, which is important. Um, and it's also a multi-stakeholder uh, approach to involve more, more people in the uh, assessment and analysis. And this is something that uh, we, we've seen is, is important in many contexts. We heard yesterday from uh, Ukraine where we're implementing area-based assessments uh, because of the changing uh, different to context and the large geography and scale of Ukraine. Or we heard yesterday about the thousands of dispersed sites in uh, Yemen and Afghanistan. And so whether this is a, a rural or urban uh, thousands of small sites dispersed. Uh, the area-based approach can be very relevant in, in many different contexts. And data and analysis at the area level is, is important uh, in informing the, the area-based uh, coordination and CCM activities with an area-based approach. Uh, but also we can take it a ne next step further and we can, we can look at actually um, moving into uh, we call agora type uh, approaches and assessments which actually tries to include further types of data there's lots of different data we can talk about key informant information we can talk about household interviews focus group discussions multi-stakeholder workshops 
um, and then the time, capacity, resources to, to collect this data is, is very uh, different. But when we look at a longer term uh, approach of making the right data available, the right analysis available at the right phase and time, we can see that we're actually looking at second and third phases of making sure that there's durable solution analysis being conducted. What are those eight criteria? What are the indicators to measure that? How do we provide the right data and analysis that we can relate back to those, those eight criteria um, and, and bring this forward to inform uh, the decision makers and, and policy makers, local uh, actors, uh, and then leading that into actual programmatic recommendations. Uh, what, can, what are some of those recommendations we can actually start to act on um, on this, this data and evidence and I think it's very important that it's always rooted in, in this data analysis and evidence, those uh, programmatic recommendations uh, for proof of, of action. And, and lastly, I, I would think that we talk a lot about the area-based coordination, area-based assessments in the areas of uh, displacement. So we're looking at zooming into an area that is hosting um, a, a displaced population uh, with with dis displaced sites, um, but can we actually look at an area-based assessment lens uh, on the other side, looking at um, the area of returns or area of origin to understand uh, data and information about the conditions and capacities of the surfaces that are accessible uh, in those areas as well to foster dialogue about uh, durable solutions and informing the displaced population about uh, such conditions and capacity. And I know that we do a lot of area-based assessments uh, in areas of, of, of displaced sites, but I think also important um, is, is perhaps, would it be also useful to understand uh, from the perspective of the capacity uh, and, and conditions in, in the areas of, of origin and return if feasible, if appropriate, in the different contexts uh, across the um, CCM responses. And uh, I'll hand it over if there's any questions in the room or, or online. Yes, um, Ruxandra, would you like to pick a question from online, please, Andre, for us? Louder. Just before we hand it over to our colleague Reem to put this in a in a practical perspective, um, given the fact that most of you and everyone online probably has already a lot of questions, we'll try to address some of those. Um, possibly take two in one if that's all right. Some protection clusters think CCCM have no role to play when thinking when linking with the return, uh, etc. How can we have a common understanding between the two clusters, I believe? Um, I'll take another one that's related. Are CCCM clusters equipped to facilitate solution discussions at country level? Uh, colleagues, what do you think? So for the first part, protection cluster is telling CCCM in some places, they have never told me but apparently this has been told. Who wants to pick up on this one, Andre? Nick. Um, that's unfortunate, but it's true. I've seen that happen. Um, it's the wrong approach. No cluster owns discussions on solutions. It's a collective responsibility. Um, and the action agenda uh, reaffirms that. So now you can point to this <laughs> and say, it is a collective uh, response. And any, and then that related to the second question, can CCCM cluster initiate discussions on solutions? Yes, why not? Um, but in the right forum. So whether it's in the sub-national uh, inter-cluster working group or at the national level, but the, those discussions should be happening from the very start um, of displacement. 
So if no one else has initiated those discussions, yes, uh, for sure. And focus on area-based approaches uh, to start with. Get the buy-in of partners and clusters on the ground and, and start developing those area-based uh, approaches, approaches for solutions. But others may have a response and from the audience as well. Thank you, uh, Nick. And I think uh, he gave the answer to that question. In case there are any similar discussions in any country, please refer to the document or tell them to talk to the global clusters. We are very happy to clarify any misunderstanding um, in, in this regard. Um, before we come to you, Rim, I saw one hand from the other side of the table, Raphael, and we have Pierre Clever, but and the three hands. Wow, the hands are getting up now. How much time we have? We have 20 minutes left, right? Including Reem, yes, sure. So we take one question from there, we go back to Reem, and then we continue with the question. Thank you, Dara, and for the presenters. Um, just to connect on that issue about CCCM having no part in discussions uh, relating to return. I think it's important for CCCM to have a paper, to have a policy position that says there are activities related to CCCM before and during returns. Because, you know, if people are living in camps, that's our Monday. So to prepare uh, before and during. And then the next is perhaps to the after the return issue would be relating to ABA, particularly where we are confronted with countries I mean, with policies in countries that the government spontaneously would return, um, IDP population and partners already have money with them to be spent or to, meant to be spent in camps. So that requires a discussion with the donors. Can we reshift? Can we shift? Can we reprogram this money to return areas? So that discussion has to be um, given considerations to. Back to you there. Thank you, Rafael. This was um, a very good example on how this could work. Um, so the idea was to give the floor to Reem first and then to continue with the questions, because I have a feeling that your question is already heard by Reem and she's preparing an answer for that one. Oh. Uh, we, we cannot wait. We cannot make uh, Reem wait too long. She's a very busy expert, by the way. Very much wanted. Reem, the floor is yours now. Okay. Uh, so I, I will be talking that uh, for REACH, we've been working with clusters to provide data and uh, analysis information for specific areas uh, for climate change and uh, the hazard impact for vulnerable people and people living in camps. Uh, although we don't have a, a solution a solution on table, uh, we, we were trying to provide the most safe solution more dignified solution for people to, uh, who's living uh, on this situation and been facing the flash flooding year after year, which is like something I uh, think we should act on more. Uh, you can see there's uh, examples uh, from uh, on your right, you can see example for Atme camp in Syria that been facing flooding each year and it's, uh, and it's one of the largest camps in Syria. And on your left, you can see Tahtin camp in Yemen that also been facing flooding each year. Uh, REACH been working on uh, hydrological uh, modeling data, uh, granule data, high resolution data uh, to provide uh, information in uh, more closely uh, to the people who can use these data to act on it, uh, programming local authorities, local NGOs, clusters. Uh, these data is not the solution. This is the first step for the solution. Uh, we can also, uh, we use this data as one layer. We use the CCM uh, IDB uh, site list uh, for overlaying our data with, this, with the CCM list. We use the shelter data list, also the shelter identification, shelter count we, uh, we have, and the camp infrastructure uh, data that we, uh, we will be collecting in our project. 
Here you, uh, you can see more zoomed in example. This is what the results would look like, the flood hazard results. You can see the flood path is walking through exactly at the middle of Otme Camp, which is actually uh, containing more than 40,000 shelters. And with the zoom in, you can see the exact shelters that will be facing the flooding and the amount of the hazard that they will be facing. This is all uh, the results for the hydrological study that we were uh, working on. Uh, for our project, as I said, uh, the flood hazard is just uh, the first a step uh, for the solution. Uh, we were now working on like map uh, flood hazards, which is like zoom in to exact camp that's been facing flooding, uh, producing a map showing the exact shelters that will be facing these floods, the exact roads. Uh, we, we also uh, did a household survey for validate our flood model. Uh, also uh, awareness uh, survey. Uh, we then uh, will be doing the camp infrastructure map. Uh, the rich engineer will be working with the local NGOs engineer going to the camp, uh, identifying the camp infrastructure in the map, uh, the drainage system, the bridges, the, uh, the culverts, everything that will be affected uh, by the flooding. And then uh, we will uh, overlay it with the flood hazard uh, the hydrological study we did, and we will make the workshop with, we will include in the workshop local NGOs, engineers, rich engineers, and a local community to overlay all of these to a flood hazard plan that can be uh, agreed on by all of these factors and uh, with every sectors, the local community, the uh, NGOs, and the engineers. Uh, for this, uh, we have a questions uh, for the CCM clusters and uh, what can be done to improve the, um, man uh, the uh, management for this disaster? Uh, what step can be done? What can be improved to be or more involved knowing that there is also uh, organizations like REACH can provide these data, these specific data uh, to improve the response and help more with the decision-making. So colleagues from REACH, James, Henry, thank you very much. Um, with that, now we have concluded with the panelists. So thank you, this was super informative. We have rounds of questions we have 15 minutes so i will try to capture all questions as much as possible but what i just wanted to highlight here since we are speaking about data and this is something super important for us sometimes we take a lot of data we don't digest the data fatigue the assessment fatigue has been something we have been hearing for the past 50 years of the humanitarian response, and sometimes the misuse or the wrong analysis of the data. I remember when we were discussing return, if you go to an IDP, if you say you want to return, I think probably 90% of them will say yes. So if you say, okay, thank you very much, and I go back, I say people want to return, I'm getting a very wrong message. Because say, then they say, okay, ask me the next question, how and when, I will return when my problem is solved. Okay, thank you very much, you're not returning. I will return when the war stops. Oh, I cannot stop the war, I'm sorry. So you don't want to return. So even these kind of questions are very tricky ones. I have been ended up in some situations where this data has been used against us and against the IDPs themselves. And I think this somehow gives an example to all of us to always be experts, since we all are apparently now on analyzing the data and making sure that the messages are passing in a correct uh, in-depth analysis towards the solution. But also what I hear that we discussed everything when we discussed solution. I don't know now what is not a solution. Everything apparently and rightly seen is a solution for us. Everything has a double uh, wing. With the question, so um, 
We will take two questions from here. If the answers have not been given to you, uh, who wants to start first? Oh my God, I like both of them want to start first. Who wants to start second? One, one, two, three. Go, okay, voila, I did not, I said something else, Alexander decided something else, Pierre. Okay, <laughs> thank you uh, for all presented. Uh, the question, it is a, like a consideration, not a, a question. Uh, in uh, local integration as a, as a solution, as a durable solution, uh, we had in some uh, humanitarian uh, actors saying that uh, uh, you can't uh, do more uh, good condition, make good condition people uh, more than local, local people. If you give a solution, durable solution, you have to consider the, the level and the standards of those people who are ruling. I think it is a, a wrong, <laughs> for me, is a not a good approach. Uh, because uh, yes, we are living, we are working, for example, in, the, in the countries where they are very poor, they are poor people. So if you provide, uh, durable solution. Uh, are we uh, going to consider those poor people as a reference? I think it is for me. It is, you have we have maybe to discuss this issue. Um, the second question, uh, second question is: uh, I think Nick has talked about uh, documentation. Um, we are working in a in a country like Chad, where people don't, don't have even ID card, how are we going to sort out this, this question? Because it's a common, <laughs> common situation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pierre Clever. If you allow me, we will take the questions. I am not sure we have the answers to all these questions. We can, if we can solve chat today we will do it uh but we I, I think that these are good questions for us to keep thinking and it applies in other other contexts as well so richard then thank you there um, my question oh my question is related to the presentation made by james and it's not really directed to james maybe to you there or one uh, when I come to a workshop like this, I want some clarity to me so that when I go back, uh, I go back with a very clear mind. Uh, and when you started this session there, you talked about uh, terminologies that we use a lot. And after James' uh, presentation, I kind of got a little bit mixed up in the terminology of area-based approach, area-based assessment, area-based coordination model, and these are nuances that we need to, to clarify and also maybe related to, to, to Giovanna, I think she led the, the session on an area-based approach and also linking up to sometimes confusion between the, the, the areas that CCCM can do the coordination and OCHA. In the field, when we talk about area-based coordination, then we're mixing up with OCHA and the CCM cluster. When we talk about the area-based approach, are we talking of the coordination, we're talking about implementation. Now a new terminology, area-based assessment. Thank you. Um, I fully agree with that one. And I, you know, we are just coming from South Sudan and we know exactly what you are talking about. Terminologies, it's getting only complicated apparently. But we have to really to transparently, bravely put it on the table to say, let's put the thoughts together. Let's see where does this stand from, from that, you know. Uh, and then Giovanni will be around. I think she, if she, I cannot see her. Um, she's there. Um, and yes, let's keep this in mind. Um, where is the mic? 
you are closer, like he's 300 meters away. Thanks very much. Um, my question is actually up on the, on the sticky notes, uh, but it's, it's good to be able to put it in, quite in person. So um, my question is about advocacy and our reaction as a, uh, a community when uh, the IASC framework, uh, like the prerequisites for um, voluntariness, uh, informed consent, uh, dignity, etc., sustainability, when these uh, red lines are clearly being breached by, um, it's usually by uh, government um, authorities, uh, we don't seem to be very strong, and I've seen this in several countries, um, at taking a unified position um, and communicating our uh, concern over this. And in some cases, it even goes to the extent that um, uh, the humanitarian community, including CCCM, is uh, supporting the premature, non-voluntary, et cetera, return. So uh, I think this might be linked to the fact that is that it comes back to that leadership issue, who, who leads um, durable solutions, who owns it, and, and the fact that that's not very clear in many cases. So um, it seems to kind of float a little bit, and then individual agencies may end up taking individual decisions as to whether to support or not support. Um, and I, I feel like this is a, a big challenge that we have in terms of uh, uh, upholding our own uh, guidelines and framework when it comes to durable solutions. Thank you. Fully agreed. So what you mean is that sometimes the accountability to affected population turns up becoming a politicized decision uh, impacted, affected by non-humanitarian interests, correct? Fully agree on that one. Um, Jorn, um, you wanted to uh, take the mic. Thanks. Uh... I, I don't know if it's a question, but a uh, statement. I think that um, this highlights uh, one of the strongest uh, benefits of the CCM cluster because the presence at the grassroots level is where we see whether solutions work for people. Whether we see that this family is exposed to domestic violence uh, or if they are prone to uh, be provided with durable solutions. So whether it's uh, uh, educational uh, and other things in place so that this family can transition from a refugee status or an IDP status to uh, <laughs> regaining their uh, kind of uh, uh, the, uh, social uh, life and uh, build on that for the future. So I think that um, it is very clear. We are here to identify the gaps. We uh, need to do this analysis on a face-to-face -face accountability level with the people we are there to help. And then we are informing the very important work of the protection cluster that can uh, feed it into some uh, diagrams and say that we uh, are providing solutions at the higher level but the grassroots uh, coordination done by the ccm is needed for each family to obtain these solutions and i think that's our strongest selling point as well tell it to the donors <laughs> fully agreed fully agreed um is there a question that we can take from uh, online would you like to read us one question Alexandra? Absolutely, and I'll go back to the panelists uh, to to respond to to some of these. Reem, actually, uh, re with relation to your presentation, I wonder um, you mentioned that uh, the process uh, you described entails quite a lot of consultation. So, related to what you've heard in these consultations, especially with the community, there's a question here: um, Is there any advice or guidance that you could share on how we should design CCCM programs? to contribute to durable solution processes. Again, with relation to what you've heard, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so I think the CCM uh, cluster works would be to advocate more, uh, looking for uh, the uh, also engaging more with the local NGOs, uh, the NGOs that have already known and a good relationship with the local communities 
uh, having good uh, also experience uh, in the local communities. So if CCM have the ability to like, uh, and it does to advocate more and connect uh, the local communities with the local NGOs and with the, uh, with the uh, specific organization that have these specific data to improve this work altogether, I think this is where it can play more role, to be honest. Thank you, um, Reem. We still have three minutes. So either we pick a, a quick question or we can conclude. Yeah, but that was one idea. But if we have only three minutes left, my idea would be is, you know, we will have a break, correct? So also you can get together to target any of the panelists to answer the questions, unless I prefer to stick to time and then we will have the break time to answer some of these questions, if that is okay. You okay, go ahead, answer too quickly. You insist. I'm sure you have it. Okay. Um, first, the question on identification documentation. Uh, this is a, a huge issue and it's, it's necessary for IDPs to have ID documentation. So first, of course, you need the agreement from authorities, the civil registration authority or equivalent body. If that isn't there, then you, it needs high level advocacy. Um, but if it's simply capacity, um, then advocating for funding for a civil registration or authority for equipment to set up remote centers near uh, IDP sites and perhaps cash assistance to IDPs to um, be able to pay um, whatever fee is required to, to obtain identification documents. Um, a couple of and, and these are practices which are currently happening in um, Yemen, for example. Um, on humanitarian principles and uh, relocations, etc., cetera, uh, when red lines are broken. So we had a, a Chatham House rules session yesterday, which is one of the breakout sessions. And this was the discussion was around red lines. I can't tell you what people said because it was a <laughs> Chatham House rule. But um, the discussion was around, one, we know that red lines get broken. So we're doing more harm by setting them and then breaking them. Um, and secondly, when we do set them, how do we ensure they're enforced? So one way is when red lines are agreed to get the buy-in from donors and make sure they're a part of the agreement and that if a red line is broken, it's, it's linked to funding. Um, and, and suspension of funding or et cetera. So that's one way to make sure that they're in the conversation. Secondly, to set red, when we set red lines to of course engage the affected population. And um, which is a challenge because they may not always agree with the red lines that we set based on the humanitarian principles, um, but they do need to be informed um, and ideally consulted that um, these red lines are going to be in, in place. Um, and if they're broken, this is, this is what the consequences for the humanitarians is, is going to be. But it is a challenging one. But you need that collective line, which of course doesn't mean they won't get broken. But if you can get the donors involved, then that's going to incentivize um, prevention of, of breaking the red lines. Thank you, Nick, for answering that question. In, in the meantime, I think just for us, we said that let's reflect on that one. Maybe later on, it will be good for all of us to discuss that documentation is necessary. I, am, I was in South Sudan coming from there, the longest humanitarian crisis, 90% of the population don't have documents. So what is necessary? Like 90% don't have documents in the longest humanitarian, what have we done? As a humanitarian about solution in the, in the past 50, 60, 70 years in one of these you know, countries, but the same applies for many other countries. So again, things that we are trying to push the agenda to move ahead, but difficult to implement is something we would probably need to reflect a little bit on. Now, I think we are done with the time. I would like to really thank you all very much for this discussion. Thanks a lot, uh, colleagues, James, James, Reem, Nick, 
great consultations, great discussions, great questions to all of you. Thank you very much. Enjoy your break.